Welcome everyone to the 13th annual Rhodes Coast Memorial Program. We will wait just a few more minutes for everyone to join in the meeting. In the meantime, I encourage you to take a list at our look of co at our look take a look at our list of co-sponsors without whom this program today would not be possible. Welcome, everyone. My name is Aaron Dulu Rabinowitz, and I'm very honored to be the Master of Ceremonies for today's event. Before we begin, I'd like to first acknowledge the committee that has worked for months to put this event together. Alana Hassan, Jordan Bihar, Ethan Marcus, Madeline Tarika Rohr, and of course, our incredible committee chair, David Bihar. We had technical assistance for this event through a combined effort by Alana Hassan, Ethan Marcus, and Jake Fawcett. I'd also like to thank our co-sponsors and national and international partners without whom we would not be able to host this important memorial. Congregation Ezra Bessarot and Sephardic Bikor Cholim, the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America, the Holocaust Center for Humanity, the Seattle Sephardic Network, Klein Gallen Community-Based Services, and the Sephardic Studies Program Straum Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Washington. I'd like to especially acknowledge Harley and Leela Franco, who in 2010 dedicated the Ezra Besserod Mediterranean Courtyard and the Martyrs Monument in honor of their parents, Robert and Lucy Franco, and Abraham and Serena Sabin of blessed memory. This is the 13th year that we have held this event and the third year that we have held it virtually. We hope to continue to honor the memories and experiences of those lost and those who survived in the Ladino vernacular para muchos años, for many years to come. With each passing year, it seems that the importance of an event like this becomes increasingly notable and the lessons learned become increasingly urgent. This commemoration is taking place at a particularly difficult moment, a time which the resurgence of anti-Semitism has gained mainstream attention. In the United States, the pervasiveness and ubiquity of anti-Semitic attitudes and sentiments have been revealed in the national discourse 
and have gained influential amplifiers. Organizations who track extremism, such as the Anti-Defamation League and Southern Poverty Law Center, have documented a significant uptick in hate crimes towards Jews, who despite making up only 2% of the US population, are the victims of 57% of religiously based hate crimes. In this moment, while the methods of dispersal and indoctrination for this hatred are new, the sentiments are not. To some degree, anti-Semitism has existed as a historical constant. Attempts at justifications and explanations for anti-Semitism tend to fall short in this lens. When Jewish diaspora communities remained separate from the societies they inhabited, they were criticized for being exclusive and mysterious, anti-patriotic and treasonous. When Jews went out from their communities to take part in society at large, the lies and suspicions followed them and the rhetoric changed to match the time. Jews once vilified for living in isolation were now demonized as a mysterious cabal responsible for the control of economic, political, and cultural institutions working secretly to undermine the societies in which they were now gaining prominence. The point is whether Jews remained isolated in their communities or go out on their own to engage with the outer world, the lies and hatred towards them persist. So the question before us becomes, what do we as individuals and as a worldwide community do in the face of this historical constant? I am speaking to you today from Krakow, Poland, only about an hour's drive from Auschwitz, where I've been living and working for the last seven months. Here in Kazimierz, the historic Jewish quarter of Krakow, there's a large building with signs outside depicting the word welcome, written in dozens of languages. It is a warm and colorful looking building with an inviting courtyard beckoning visitors to partake in the events inside. That building is a Jewish community center and for the last 14 years has utilized the historical model of Jewish response to persecution. Here at the epicenter of the horrors of the Holocaust, this Jewish community center remains open, servicing not just the small but active Jewish community here in Krakow, but also seeking to spread light to the community around it. Here in Krakow, there is an annual citywide cult Jewish cultural festival. There are weekly Shabbat dinners welcome to anyone. And for the last 11 months, they have been providing aid services to Ukrainians fleeing the conflict across the border. This is the Jewish model of resistance, to survive, to thrive, and to illuminate. Last month, we celebrated Hanukkah in which we remember the story of resistance against the dominant military and cultural power of the day, a power that sought to erase Jewish identity and replace it with their own. It is no coincidence that we commemorate that resistance through a festival of light. In the face of rising hatred, it is ever more important that we follow this model set out for us. We resist through survival and through illumination. We illuminate the beauty of our songs, the, de the deliciousness of our foods, and the memory of our ancestors. We commemorate and honor those we have lost by becoming the best versions of ourselves, not just as individuals, but as communities. The two speakers that we have today embody this model and the contributions they have given to their communities and to the wider world, bridging the gap between Rhodesley communities as geographically distant as Zimbabwe, South Africa, and Seattle. The two individuals who will be presenting today are each accomplished and well-known representatives, leaders, and true ambassadors of, of the diaspora Rhodesley community and are dedicated each in their own way to the preservation of its history and traditions. Following their presentations, we will have the core of today's event, the Hashkava ceremony, where, where we will commemorate and honor the memories of those lost in the Holocaust. Please remember to stay through these presentations so that we can experience this Hashkava ceremony together as a community. To commence the program, committee member Jordan Bihar will introduce our first presentation of the day and our presenter, Stella Hannon Cohen. Please now turn your attention to Jordan Bihar. Thank you, Erin. Hi, everyone. It is my honor to introduce to you our next presenter, Stella Hannon-Cohen. Stella is a renowned cookbook author and artist. 
She is also the great-granddaughter of Yaakov Kapoya, who was the rabbi of Rhodes in the early 20th century and a descendant of the Sephardic Jews of Rhodes. From the time she was young, Stella was moved by and drawn to the culinary tradition of the Rhodesly Jews and considered it a meaningful way to perpetuate Sephardic culture and way of life. This language of food, combined with the Ladino language of the Jews of Rhodes, inspired Stella to author a book, Stella's Sephardic Table, Jewish Family Recipes from the Mediterranean Island of Rhodes, which has won five prestigious international awards and transformed her into a renowned cookbook author. In addition to Stella's success as an author, she's also an extremely gifted artist. Her art reflects the journeys of her ancestors, as well as the mystic symbolism of women and their archetypes in other Sephardic cultures. Her work has been exhibited extensively, especially in South Africa and in the United States. Stella is also an honorary life chairperson of the Sephardic community of Zimbabwe and has always been active in humanitarian work. In 1999, Stella was honored as a woman to watch by Jewish Women International in the US. All three of Stella's pursuits, gastronomy, art, and philanthropy, are an expression of her deep connection to her Sephardic heritage and culture. At the root of it all is Stella's story about a Rodesley family and community. Stella's father was born in Rhodes. He left for Africa as a young man, and then he lost his family in the Holocaust. He went on to build a beautiful family and successful life, and his legacy lives on through Stella and her good work. Through the loss, perhaps in spite of it, Stella and her family have perpetuated our Rhodesley culture and traditions in unique ways. In 1964, Stella and her family, cousins of ours, visited Seattle and met my family. It has been 60 years, and except for a brief meeting a few years ago in New York, they have not seen each other since. But they've maintained a deep familial bond that is a reflection of the innate desire to stay connected to family, community, tradition, and heritage. That is the essence of Stella's story. And with that, I will turn it over to her. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, for that very heartwarming introduction. It's such an honor to participate in this poignant commemoration from my home in Zimbabwe. David has invited me to share my multi-generational family saga that spans centuries and continents. It began in medieval Spain and continued from Rhodes to Rhodesia now Zimbabwe, and has endured with my children and grandchildren who live in New York. I'm a descendant of the Sephardic Jews of Rhodes Island and great granddaughter of Rabbi Yaakov Kapuya of Rhodes. I was born in Zimbabwe, where I still live to this day. Although the story is not a singular one, it is another piece of our Jewish history that cannot be lost. It offers a glimpse of two unique worlds of our Sephardic ancestral history, transcending generations that have vanished. One is the story of the Jews exiled from Spain in 1492 and their forced displacement. The other, the eradication of our once vibrant Jewish community that has existed in the island of Rhodes for centuries. The Jews flourished for centuries in Spain during a period of unsurpassed coexistence amongst the Christians and Muslims. The expulsion in 1492 marked a momentous turning point in our history. My ancestors, fled to the lands of the Ottoman Empire, where they found refuge in the island of Rhodes. 
with great determination and resilience, the Jews of Spain established a distinctive Judeo-Spanish Ladino speaking universe in the Jewish quarter of Rhodes, La Juderia. The Jews of Rhodes, the Rodislis, tenaciously maintained the culture of their Iberian ancestors and blended the legacy of medieval Spain with that of their adopted land of refuge. My father, Sam Hannan, was born and grew up on this idyllic island. In 1936, faced with the economic stagnation in Rhodes, he, like many others at that time, made a heart-wrenching decision to take leave of his family and seek opportunities in Southern Africa to relocate in the British colony, Rhodesia. Lured, like other Rodisley adventurers, by the stories of the gold rush and trading companies being established there, he sailed to the unknown shores of Africa. These hardworking immigrants endured a lonely existence, rebuilding their lives in rural trading outposts in an unfamiliar country infested with tropical diseases, including malaria, sleeping sickness, and Bilhazia. It was in fact another world settling in landlocked Rhodesia with the hot climate, bush vegetation and wildlife. The divergent African and Anglo-Saxon cultures were so vastly different from the faraway place he had left behind. The centuries old Sephardic enclave of Rhodes surrounded by the Aegean Sea. In time, these immigrants would sponsor family members from their mere meager earnings to join them. But for many, including my father, that illusion was to be shattered. On July 23rd, the entire community of the Jews of Rhodes was rounded up and sent on the longest journey measured by time and distance of any deportation, where 90% of our community were murdered on arrival at Auschwitz. Only 151 survived. When my father learned of the tragic fate that his entire family had perished in Auschwitz, he, like others, had to reconstruct his life after his home, his people, and his family had vanished. After this cataclysmic devastation of our historic Sephardic community, he became, like his ancestors, half a millennium before, a 20th century Sephardic exile, now, in Africa. With vision and hard work, my father became a successful entrepreneur. In 1946, on a buying trip to the Belgian Congo to import timber for his furniture factory, he met and was captivated by my mother, Marie. Marie, at age 10, had immigrated from Turkey to the Congo. Only fluent in Turkish, she found herself in a French-speaking school run by nuns in Elizabethville, l'Institut Marie-José. After their marriage in Elizabethville, my parents settled in Salisbury, Rhodesia. In 1931, the Sephardic congregation was founded and continued to grow and thrive. The Share Shalom Synagogue and the Rhodes Community Memorial Hall was inaugurated by Dr. Gawon in 1958. The Rhodian immigrants built a tight-knit community, preserving and nurturing the same rich traditions, liturgy, language, and culinary legacy of our ancestors. We were blessed over decades with extraordinary spiritual leaders, including Rabbi Papo, Reverend Bezaken, Reverend Ishai, 
Diane Toledano, and Rabbi Suiza. Regrettably, we have had no spiritual guidance for over 40 years, but have been fortunate to have had remarkable, dedicated men and women who untiringly attend to our communal needs to this day. Throughout the decades, our Roddesley community celebrated religious and life cycle events steeped in our traditions centered around our synagogue complex. The combined Ashkenazi and Sephardic communities contributed immeasurably towards trade and industry and played a significant cultural and professional role towards the development of Zimbabwe. In 1961, the Jewish population peaked at 7,000, only to diminish to 1,000 by 1987 as a result of emigration, dwindling now to a mere 50 souls from both communities. As we remember those we lost, we also acknowledge the Rodisley survivors of the Holocaust. Amongst those that settled in Rhodesia are Rachel Hanan, Jacques Hasson, Lucia Amato, Regina Menashi, Violetta Fins, Diamante Franco, Asher Varon, and Rosa Ferreira. Kisos Almas reposing in Paz. My Sephardic journey began as a young girl. I recall when I ventured into my mother's kitchen, how the aromas of our Rodisley dishes enveloped me with such comforting emotions. As I watched generations of women known as Las Maestras, each with their own culinary wisdom and well-guarded secrets, gather at home to prepare for celebrations with so much love, these moments would become magically transformed. I was entranced seeing them expertly molding our savory pastries, desayuno, using centuries old techniques from medieval Spain and the Ottoman Empire. As they created, I felt transported to a bygone time and place, hearing them sing Judeo-Spanish songs Canticas with their enchanting melodies and medieval ballads, romances. I became intrigued how our foremothers had tenaciously clung on with such nostalgia and longing to their collective past from the Iberian Peninsula for over 500 years. At those times, I could have been in the ancestral kitchens of the Jewish quarters in Moorish Spain or in the island of Rhodes. Growing up in Rhodesia, I straddled three very distinct and diverse worlds. I shifted constantly from the rigid and formal English schooling environment to the warm embrace of my Sephardic home. On my return from school, I would be greeted with terms of endearment in Ladino, hearing my polyglot parents speaking a unique blend of Ladino French, Greek, Italian, Turkish, and English. All the while growing up, I was surrounded by the magic, beauty, and mystique of Africa. Some inexplicable force drew my father Sam back to Rhodes Island. With such mixed emotions, he took my mother, my sister Vera and me on the first of what would be many visits to Rhodes Island, where he tried to retrieve and retell the story of the forgotten world of his youth that the Nazi regime had extinguished. Reconnecting with his Greek childhood friends, he would reminisce and exchange narratives with the diaspora Rhodians and Auschwitz survivors who were visiting the island. It became for us 
as the historian Rodriga explains, an island of memory. We traveled frequently to connect with long forgotten relatives and visit Sephardic communities in Europe and South and North America. It was on one of these memorable trips that I encountered my dear cousin, David Bihar and his family in Seattle. Following my parents' footsteps, I too shared with my children and grandchildren the journey of discovering our Odyssey roots and fascinating history meandering through the streets, Las Calesias, of the ancient Judea. These meaningful experiences, combined with my love for our Sephardic gastronomic traditions, fueled me with the passion to transmit, safeguard, and keep alive our unique heritage. My children, Claude and Monique Levy, who left home to attend college in the US, were the driving force for me to preserve the familiar Rodisley cuisine and traditions they so yearned for that transported them back to their childhood in Zimbabwe. I then embarked on a labor of love for 10 years, collating, testing, and recreating my mother's handwritten treasured family recipes for my book, Stella Sephardic Table, Jewish Family Recipes from the Mediterranean Island of Rhodes. I was thrilled that the cookbook won five international awards. I dedicated this book to the women of Rhodes Island who were the keepers of knowledge and tradition of my Sephardic culinary heritage. I quote, this book is dedicated to their memory. It encapsulates for posterity their extraordinary gastronomic skills honed over time and tragically snuffed out by their deportation to Auschwitz in 1944, end quote. It was an act of hope that their indomitable spirit would live on through this book. To be seated at our Rodesli Sephardic table is to bear witness to centuries of culinary heritage overflowing with stories and traditions handed down for us to recreate in our homes. This wholesome Mediterranean home cooking from Spain, enriched with the Ottoman gastronomy, is showcased at our mise table. Our food is served all at once with everyone gathered around the table, an act of sharing in a convivial atmosphere we call gozar de la vida. The Rodislees, renowned for their generous hospitality, celebrated life cycle events with mesas de alegria, called tables of happiness, resplendent with magnificent confectionery and pastries. Our traditional sweets include marzipan, masapan, orange sponge cake, pan de España, we call meringues, achoplados, honey covered crescents, trabados, sweet preserves, almond shortbread, corabies, and sesame seed, brittle, bolocono. These sweet treats have remained the same before and after the Holocaust. Our beloved dulces are still being made in our homes throughout the diaspora. 500 years after our ancestral exile from Spain, I felt I had come finally back full circle when in 2017, I was honored by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Spain Mr. Dastis Quesedo. His recognition of my de dedication as a Jew of Spanish descent towards perpetuating our ancient language and culture marked the pinnacle of my Judeo-Spanish journey. It has been my quest 
to preserve and revitalize our Sephardic gastronomic legacy, collaborating internationally with chefs, organizations, and communities, and contribute to many publications and media. In Zimbabwe, it has also been my mission to host events at home with diplomats and ambassadors to savor our cuisine and engage in culinary exchanges. I have been actively engaged in philanthropic work with the former First Lady Sally Mugabe with Save the Children and helped establish the first ophthalmy, ophthalmology clinic. Together with the Sephardic Women's Committee, we have worked tirelessly with a focus towards health and social welfare in Zimbabwe. Other ways I have chosen to express my Sephardic heritage with a strong link in Africa was through my art, merging the identity of African women with Sephardic spirituality, portraying images of their diverse archetypes as protectors, nurturers, healers, and the vibrant woman I have encountered. And now I would like to share two images that resonate strongly with me. My aunt Matilda Hanan, standing in front of the Castellana Fountain in Rhodes in 1936. She perished in Auschwitz. 83 years later, I stood in the same place at the 75th commemoration of the deportation of the Jews of Rhodes. I would like to close with this image of the seahorse fountain in the square of the martyred Jews. I prepared a plate of traditional sweets like our foremothers made for centuries and placed them at this historic fountain in the Juderia with my children and grandchildren. This for me was a symbolic affirmation that the legacy of our once thriving community has survived against all odds. Neither the inquisition nor the deportation centuries later eradicated our cherished culinary heritage. It is alive for our children and generations to come, bringing with it our love for food and life. Merci mucho. Buenas noches. Thank you, Stella. We now invite Madeline Tarika Rohr to introduce the second presenter of today's event, Joe Malel. Thank you, Stella. We now invite Madeline Tarika Rohr to introduce the second presenter of today's event, Joe Malel. Hello. Thank you all again for attending the 13th annual Rhodes and Koss Holocaust Memorial Program. My name is Madeline Tarika Rohr, and I am part of this year's Memorial Program Committee. I'm also the granddaughter of Stella and Morris Tarika. My grandmother, Stella, was born in Rhodes and lived there until she was just 13 years old when she was deported and taken to Auschwitz. After spending around a year in Auschwitz, she was eventually liberated and reunited with her uncle, her brother, and her sister in the Belgian Congo of Africa. Eventually, Stella immigrated to the US and moved to Seattle in the Seward Park neighborhood where she met and married Morris. Stella and Morris went on to have two daughters, my aunt Phyllis and my mother Jackie. As the granddaughter of a survivor, it is particularly meaningful to be part of this program as we acknowledge the sacred martyrs and survivors of the Holocaust. It is my pleasure to introduce to you all today one of our presenters, Joe Malau, a well-known documentarian and historian within the Rotisley community of Cape Town, South Africa. 
For decades now, Joe has followed his passion for Sephardic history and specifically the history of the Jewish community of Rhodes in the 20th century. He was involved in documenting the testimony of Rhodes survivors of the Holocaust, was involved in the creation of the Sephardic section of the Holocaust Museum in Cape Town, and has presented his work through numerous organizations, including the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center in the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. I was introduced to Joe through the Sephardi Hebrew Congregation of Cape Town, and while getting to know him through the development of his program, I found out that Joe was a close friend of my great uncle, Stella's brother, Asher Baron, when he lived in um, South Africa. Um, in the picture you'll see on the left is Joe in the back right corner, as well as Asher next to him. And then the photo to the right is a photo of a share. Joe has put together a wonderful presentation for us that is compiled from presentations he has made at the Holocaust and Genocide Center in Cape Town. Today, Joe is on a well-deserved vacation with his family and pre-recorded his presentation, but is in the audience. I'd like to thank Joe for his continued work and participation in today's event. We will now move into Joe's presentation. Thank you. Kechaber, good morning and good evening to all of you around the world. I would like to thank the Roads and Coast Memorial Committee of Seattle for inviting me to talk. I will also like to thank Madeline Tarika Rowe for the effort she has put into organizing this event. In August 2022, I gave a presentation to the Holocaust Center in Cape Town for the commemoration of the 78th anniversary of the deportation of the Rhodes Lees from Rhodes Island regarding the concentration camp called Koffering. Most of these leads and never heard of Koffering, and that is my reason today to recount the story. Before I continue, I would like to mention that 1,763 Jewish Rhodes leads were deported from Rhodes Island to Auschwitz in July 1944, and 151 survivors. A few years ago, I received an email from a German gentleman called Manfred Dieler, who is the director of the European Memorial in the Landsberg. Mr. Dieler is tasked with, with maintaining the ma infrastructure of the Koffering camp. In his email, Mr. Dieler asked whether I was related to Allegra Malel. I replied that she was my father's sister. Koffering was a communal name for 11 subcamp which fell under the administration of Dachau concentration camp. These camps operate between 18 June 1944 and 27 April 1945 and were situated around the town of Landsberg and Bavaria in Bavaria. Previously, the Nazi Germany has deported all Jews from the Reich by having exhausted other forms of labor. They transport Jews back to the camp to build three enormous underground bunkers, which will not be vulnerable to Allied attacks. The bunkers were intended to produce Messerschmitt aircraft, but no aircraft were produced before the, the camp were liberated by the United States Army on the 29th of April. 1945. Koffering was the largest of the Dachau camp, and the camp were the worst condition. About half of 30,000 prisoners, prisoners died in hunger, disease, execution, or during the dead march. Women in forced labor were used, in particularly, particularly large number in the Munich region and the surrounding area of Koffering Landsberg Satellite Camp Complex. About 4,200 female prisoners were forced to work in armament production. Three barracks of the former women camps were restored by a special construction project. 
During the restoration of this accommodation barrack at the former concentration camp covering seven, while taking pictures of the interior of the clay tube building, Mr. Dis Mr. Dealer discovered four names engraved in the title in the tile story by a woman from Rhodes. The names were Rachel Sulam, Allegra Malel, Suzanne Gaon, and Laura Asson. Mr. Dillier want to know whether I had information about them and whether they had immigrated to Africa. Roddy's leaves were divided uh, into different camps after two months in Auschwitz. On October 27, April, uh, sorry, on 27 October 1944, 90 Rodis Lees, mainly women, were transported to Koffering on cattle wagon. On the 17th of December 1944, they were transported again on cattle wagon to Bergen Belsen and Bergen-Belsen was liberated on April 15, 1945. On multiple occasions, the prisoners being transported on cattle wagon were attacked by Allied aircraft. In one of these attacks, which hit a train carrying ammunition as well as 7,800 prisoners, hundreds of victims were killed. There is a memorial stone Beside the railroad track, this big picture shows how it looks today. Dachau is 60 kilometers from Koffering. Only the strong and healthy prisoners were able to walk on the Dead March, which took approximately three days. The Dead March began in Koffering Camp 1. Dead March were massive force transfer of prisoners from one Nazi camp to another location where prisoners were forced to march. These photos are the only one taken of the covering prisoners. They, they are in existence today. Mr. Diller sent me the list of the 90 Rodislees who were deported to covering, as well as the list of the men who died in the camp. If any of you have any relation of these men, please contact me. You will find my email address at the end of this presentation. The names are Kapalu Tonisim, 38 years old, Cohen Menachem, 27, Levi Yeshua, 23, Cohen Solomon, 24, Cunio Giacomo, 25, Aladef Alberto, 29, Asson Solomon, 46, Asson Alberto, 17, Benun Alberto, 29, Asson Joseph 29, Capoluto Nisim 38. If you are having any relation, I may get some documents from Mr. Gillo. Now I'm going to talk about my Auntie Allegra Malel, whose signature was discovered in the clay barrack by Mr. Gillo. She was transferred to Italy after the liberation of Dachau in, on the 29th of April 1945. After arrival in Italy, her health deteriorated and half of the body was paralyzed. And she died in Bologna on the 11th of August 1945 and she was, and she was buried there. Her brother, my uncle Giuseppe Pepo Malel, who survived the Bergen-Belsen slave labor camp, was able to obtain the necessary document after a few years to transfer my own body to a Jewish cemetery. I visited the grave for the first time on the 13th of August 2018, almost exactly 73 years after her death. Speaking with Mr. Dealer, no Rodis Lis have yet have never yet visited Koffering. I hope to visit him and take uh, an, an, uh, a commemoration plaque with me on, for the Rodis Lis. This concludes the first part of my presentation. 
I will not talk about my other aunt, Aunt Rosa Rosha Hanan, as well as about other survivors after the war who married in the Congo and Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. Rosa Rosha Hanan was born in Rhodes on September 8, 1920. Her father was Moses, her mother was Miriam Leon. Before the war, Rosa, oldest brother, left for Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. Excuse me. Before the end of the year, she was transferred to Dachau together with several other women from Rhodes. From there, she was sent to a subfield of Koffering, Landsberg and Torquay, where she carried out very heavy work pushing railway wagon on the railway track. I had the opportunity to interview her in Rhodes in 2014. I will try. She speaks in Ladino and uh, she's explaining the work that they used to do on the rail. Let me see if it works. I hope so. There we are. Chicos que metes cosas y lo arranjas. ¿Cómo se llama esto para un chico? El chario. Sí. Chario. Ah, es el Más grande de esta tabla. No sé cuánto era. Esto. De aquí fin ahí. De la mesa. De mármol. Bueno. Hacemos este mármol. Me parece que era en 6 gigas. Y metemos en este en este barco. Sorry about that. Trying to go forward. All right. In April 1945, with the imminent advance of the Allies, Rosa decided to flee along with three companions from Rhodes under the pretext of bringing milk from the kitchen to the SS. Uh, quarters. They moved away from the camp and took off into a surrounding forest. The four managed to hide on a farm nearby where they remained for about a week and were held by a German woman farmer until the liberation. With the camp now in the hands of the Allies, they returned to Torquem and remained there until the end of May 1945. In June, they arrived in the former Offenburg camp under the control of the French armed forces, where the captain was Jewish, placed them in an apartment near the camp. Due to an accidental explosion of a bomb in Offenburg command, the captain lost his life. Rosa was there a few meters from that, and she was ser seriously injured, and she was admitted to hospital for over a month, which we after about six weeks, she left for Milan, and there she met Giuseppe Pepo Malel, my uncle, also a Rhodian survivor who had lost his wife and two children in Auschwitz. They married on the 6th of March 1947 on Rhodes, and in December of the same year, their first child, Nisim, was born. After six months, they returned to Rome. In 1951, the family moved to the Belgian Congo, where their second son was born, to whom they gave the same name as Rosa brother Herzl, who died in Montezum. They returned to Italy in 1954. Uh, since then, Tante Rosa lived in Rome, surrounded by a family to whom she handed down a strong identity as a Rodisley Jew, and she died on January 2, 2022, at the age of 100 years old, just a year ago. Now, Rhodes was a British protectorate for two years after the end of the war, remaining under an Italian administration until it was transferred to Greece. Rosa and Giuseppe wedding ceremony photo was taken in the house of Mr. Soriano, who was president of the Jewish community of Rhodes at the time. It was 
the first and last Jewish wedding under Italian administration, and their son Niso was the first and last Italian-born Jew in Rhodes after the war. In this wedding photo, most of the guests, sorry, most of the guests were survivors who has returned to Rhodes. We have today, uh, sorry, uh, and some were, some of these leads were saved by Turkish consul. And we have today Lina Amato on Zoom. I hope she's online. And we try to see if she can speak a few minutes afterwards. I'm not sure of that. Uh, Lina Amato lives in Cape Town. In the picture, she was nine years old and is sitting second from left. Lina made a documentary of her experience a few years ago um, regarding the story of the Turkish uh, consul. The Turkish consul, uh, Selahan Ulkuman, was, uh, was a Turkish consul of Rhodes in, in uh, sorry, and he saved 42 Jews of Turkish citizenship from being evacuated to Auschwitz. Yad Vashem has recognized him as writers among the nation. The picture show, he, uh, I have to go on this one, that's the CD of uh, Lina Amato. And here we have Suleiman Ukuman uh, as a great guest of the Sephardi community of Cape Town with Myra Orson, founder of the Cape Town Holocaust Center and myself in the year 2000. Okay, all right. And this is the Malel family a few years ago when we visit Russia in Rome. Okay, this is the story of Matilda Israel and her husband, Albert Asson, who were deported together with all the other Rodizlis. When they arrived in Athens, she and her daughter, Stella, were separated from her husband. Suddenly, a German soldier shouted in Italian, is everyone here Italian? Matilda shouted, American, American, American. The German soldier put uh, her and Stella in a cell where they stay without food or water. In the morning, the soldier came back and she shouted again, husband, husband, husband. He understood and took her and to show him who her husband was. Lucky they were. They were incarcerated in the cell for a few days and then transferred to a camp until the liberation of Athens in October 12, 1944. The yellow spot, that's the Stella Surmani who passed away, Matilda's daughter. They were the first witness to tell the story of the deportation and, and journey from Rhodes to Athens. They were also the first one to return to Rhodes. Uh, I have a full interview with uh, Matilda with the story from 20 years ago. All right. And this is a picture that I did when they were doing a film of Stella and uh, Rosa in Rhodes in 2014. This is all my family who was exterminated by the Nazi. And it's me in uh, Auschwitz. And as you can see, I've got a small stone that I brought from Rhodes. And we call that stone Sheshu. I repeat, Sheshu. If you go in some houses in Rhodes, all the floors are made of Sheshus. So I took that in memory of all the Jews of Rhodes to Auschwitz. Okay. A group of Odisli survivors came to the Congo and Zimbabwe after the war to meet families who had left the roads before the war. They married and built families and business. This group of survivors made a big contribution to the Jewish life 
by creating the separating school and community in Cape Town. That picture was done in 2005. Unfortunately, they were gone. Okay. One of the first survivors to arrive in Elizabethville today, Lubumbashi, was Stella Sigura, who arrived on the 20 March 1946. She married Moise Israel. In this picture, you can see that most of her disease were at the airport, together with her brother Rafael, to welcome her. Rafael and left roads on one of the last boats in 1939. Here is a selection from my collection of photographs of various weddings from the, from the Congo and Zimbabwe. These weddings of survivors took place between 1946 and nine, 1946 and 5th of July 1960. The last wedding was Aaron Franco, who was a teenager at the end of the war. I had the privilege to meet all the survivors in Cape Town and film each of them with their own story. You can watch these videos on YouTube by typing Joe Malel, Joe without the E, Malel, M-A-L-L-E-L, -L -L, and next to it you type Vidas Largas, Vidas Largas. In my speech, I discover, uh, sorry, in my search, I discovered that Madeleine's grandmother, Stella Varon, was also in Koffering when she was 14 years old. Today, she's well at 92 years old and uh, living in Seattle. If she's lo she looking at the program, I send her my best regards to her. I also have a book writing by Stella's sister, Laura Varon, called The Juderia. Before I finish, I request if you go to Europe and in the area of Munich, Mr. Diller and his wife Elga will really appreciate that Rodis Lees visit the covering signs. Uh, here you see Mr. Diller with uh, some, the, the old man in the middle, is, he, ca he came from Israel with some other people to visit covering, and that was a few years ago. And this was the 75th anniversary of the liberation, but uh, it was just after the COVID, so they could not do a, a bigger a thing. And that's the people who do help him on, uh, on this uh, covering organization. This is in uh, Ashur in Cape Town. And naturally, this is a, a picture that everybody knows. Uh, this is at the Holocaust uh, Center in Cape Town with uh, Hida Blumenthal, the executive director of the Holocaust Genocide Center. And I'm sure she's looking at us. And I thank her on behalf of all the Rodis leads of Cape Town of what she's been doing for us. Thank you very much. And this is a picture of our community in 1980. I regret I didn't have a better picture than this. Well, I thank you all again. And uh, we're not February yet, so I can say, Anyata buena, kun salut, y paz. Goodbye from Cape Town, and thank you. Thank you to Joe and to Madeline. We especially want to acknowledge and honor Madeline, who is here representing her grandmother, Stella Tarika. Stella Tarika is very dear to all of us, and we as a community wish to express our appreciation of her. We will now begin our Hashkava ceremony. We will start the ceremony with a moment of silence, followed by the reading of Psalms, first by Rabbi Ben Shlush of Congregation Ezra Besarot, then by Rabbi Ben Hassan of Sephardic Bikur Cholim, and then Frank Varen, the Hazan of Sephardic Bikur Cholim. After the reading of Psalms, we will have the Hashkava prayer, 
sung by Simon ben the rabbi, the rabbi emeritus of congregation Ezer Besarot, and Isaac Azuz, the Chazan emeritus of congregation Ezer Besarot. Please join me now for a brief moment of silence in commemoration of those lost before the Hashkavah ceremony. Thank you. We will now begin the Hashkava commemoration with the Psalms read by Rabbi Ben Shlush of Sephardic Bikur Cholim. Shalom, my name is Rabbi David Ben Shlush, Rabbi of Rabbi Sarot in Seattle, former Rabbi of Sephardi Hebrew Congregation of Cape Town. Uh, the connection to this program uh, is very dear to me uh, as uh, I've been uh, involved in the Rota Sleep communities uh, for quite some time now. And so I'd like to thank our sponsors, our partners. I'd like to thank uh, Stella Hanan Cohen, Joe Malel. I'd like to thank the Franco family for their uh, sponsorship of this very important event. And uh, of course, all our friends here, our Rabbanim uh, and uh, our uh, affiliations here today, we're going to share and recite Psalm number 126, Mizmor uh, from Tehillim. Follow along if you have an open source, or you can just follow along as we recite it together. Shira Malot, Beshuv Adonai, Shiva Zion, Ainu Keholimim, Azimale Sehopinu, Ulshone Norina, Azimerova Goim. Igdil Adonai la sote mele, Igdil Adonai la sote manu, Hainu semehim, Shuva Adonai, et shevitenu, Kafikim banegev, Azoreim bedima, Berina iksoru, Halo hele huvaho, No se meshe hazara, Boyavo verina, No se alumota, and the psalm, uh, the prophet. Acknowledging and uh, bringing testimonial uh, uh, linguistic expressions uh, as to the time of uh, the Jewish people in the Babylonian exile, where they were envisioning the uh, the days to come, coming back towards Yerushalayim, and so uh, we don't see a distinction between a hope, a dream, a prophecy, to actually real life. Uh, occurrences. The only uh, difference is, is the uh, uh, physical application. Whereas in the heartfelt the desires and in the ha heartfelt belief, it's almost as if they can already see themselves back in their promised land, back in their rightful uh, place of heritage. Uh, and so they are saying, Azim Alisa Then uh, everyone will acknowledge, and we will all have will be uh, filled with laughter and joy. But even now, our hearts are full of that uh, uh, diligence to God, knowing that He's there waiting to redeem the Jewish people. There's something interesting here, that we uh, compare the exile to the Negev, to the southern dry part uh, of the land of Israel. And so there, there's no energy, there's nowhere really to plant or to derive a source of inspiration. But still, the Jewish people, even though they were in, in exile in a place uh, that maybe had nothing uh, of, of, of a hope for them, they still were Zorim Bedima, they still planted with their tears. And so the Jewish people, Am Yisrael planting, even though it doesn't make sense, even though everything around them tells them that there's no point and no hope and in and, and, and a promise for a, a future redemption, nevertheless they plant uh, and surely they will reap uh, their harvest. Uh, we wish everyone here uh, a, a lot of Beracha and Shalom. Thank you for having me. honor and a privilege to be with you here this morning to memorialize those that died in the Shoah, in the Holocaust from Sephardic countries. It is our obligation, our duty to remember each and every year those that died and by doing so, by memorializing them, we keep their memory alive. I've chosen Psalm 130, Kuf Lamed. Shir Hama Alot, 
ממעמקים קראתיך אדוני, אדוני שמע בקולי, תהיינה אוזניך קשובות לכל תחנוני, אם עוונות תשמעי אדוני מי יעמוד, כי מכעס אליך למען תיברא, כי ביתי אדוני כבית הנפשי, לדברו הוכלתי, נפשי לאדוני מי שומרים לבוקר, שומרים לבוקר, יחל ישראל אל אדוני, כי אם עלי החסד והבהים אופדות, והוא יפדה את ישראל מכל עוונותיו. I call out from the depths, ממעמקים, קראתיך השם. I call out from the depths to you, השם. Please answer our prayer. May God, may Almighty God, always answer our prayers in times of need and in times of joy. And may all those who died in the Shoah, may their memory be for a blessing. Tehed nishmatam, tzura b'tzur ha'chayim b'gan Eden, amen, can you hear that song? Kantika de la Zagradas Quando yo also mis ojos a los montes Pensando de adonde vendrá mi ayuda Veo que mi ayuda es solo de Coradonai Hacedor de los cielos y la tierra El cual no dará al resbalamiento a tu pie Porque no se adormecerá tu guardador Pues que es no se adormece jamás y no duerme el guardador de Israel. Adonai es tu verdadero guardador. Adonai es tu sombra sobre la mano de tu derecha. Con el que de día el sol no te irá. Y la luna en la noche, porque Adonai te guardará de todo mal, y guardará a tu persona a sí mismo. Adonai guardará tu salida y tu entrada desde ahora y hasta siempre. A Song of Ascents I lift up my eyes to the hills, whence comes my help. My help is from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. May he not suffer thy foot to slip, may he not slumber who guards thee. Lo, the guardian of Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. It is the Lord who guards thee, it is the Lord at thy right hand who is thy shelter. The sun shall not hurt thee by day, nor the moon by night. It is the Lord who will guard thee from every evil, who will guard thy life. It is the Lord who will guard thy going out and thy coming in, now and forevermore. Tov shem mi shemen tov, menucha nechona tachat kanfea shechina, kezo arara kia mazirim, el male rachamim umit male berachama vamerubim, על נפשות רוחות ונשמות, במעלות קדושים ותורים וגיבורים, כזוהר הרקיע מזהירים, לנשמות אחינו הקדושים, הספרדים והרומניות, שנפלו חלק מששת מיליוני היהודים, חללי השואה, במלחמת העולם השנייה באירופה, שנהרגו, שנשחטו, שנשרפו ושנספו על קידוש השם בידי המרצחים הגרמנים הנאצים ועוזריהם משאר העמים עם אשמם לכן בעל הרחמים ועשה ליחוד אז תירם בסתר כנפיך לעולמים ובצל שדי יתלוננו לקץ הימים תעמידם ומנחל על עניך תשכם וצרור בצרור החיים את נשמותיהם ותשים כבוד מנוחתם ותלווה עליהם השלום ותקיים בהם מקרא שכתוב 
ונחך אדוני תמיד והשביע בצצך עוד נפשך ועצמותך יחליץ והיית כגן רבי וכמו צמאים מה שלא יחזב וממיו אדוני הוא נחלתם בגן עדן תהה מנוחתם ויעמדו לגורלם לקץ הימים ונאמר אמן God full of mercy who dwells in the height provide a sure rest upon the divine presence wings within the range of the holy and the pure who shining resemble the skies all the souls of our holy brethren Sephardim and Romaniot who were cut off among the six million of our Jews victim of the European Holocaust who were murdered, slaughtered, burnt and exterminated for the sanctification of your name by the German Nazi assassin and their cohort help us from the rest of the world. Therefore, Master of Mercy, protect them forever from behind the hiding of your wings and tie their soul with the bond of life eternal. May the everlasting be their heritage and the Garden of Eden be their resting place and they shall rest peacefully upon their couch. They will stand for their fate in the end of days And let us say, Amen. Tu mare quando te pario, chi te quito al mundo, corazón e ya no te dio, para amar segundo, Corazón, ella no te dio para amar segundo. Adiós, adiós, querida, no quiero la vida, me la amargates tú. Adio, adio, querida, no quiero la vida, me la amargates tú. Va, búscate otro amor. Ajar va a otras puertas, espera otro ardor, que para mí sos muerta. Espera otro ardor, que para mí sos muerta. Adio, adio, querida, no quiero la vida, me la amargates tú. Adio, adio, querida. No quiero la vida, me la amargates tú. This concludes our Hashkava ceremony and memorial program. I'd first like to correct myself as I misspoke earlier. Rabbi Ben Shlush is, of course, our wonderful rabbi at Congregation Ezra Besarot. Thank you, everyone, for coming today and joining us from all over the world in order to create a space to honor and commemorate. We've been joined today by 285 participants, and of course, we know that many who join into our call represent families logging on together. We are extremely honored to have had you all join and commemorate with us. We'd like to once again thank our presenters, Joe Malel and Stella Hannon-Cohen, and our committee members, co-sponsors, and national and international partners. We hope that you found today's event enlightening, memorable, and meaningful. Through events like this one today, we encourage you to reflect 
and continue to honor the memories of those lost. As we come together as a unified global community, we carry on the torch of Jewish life for generations to come. In that vein, on behalf of the entire Rhodes Coast Memorial Committee, I'd like to thank you all for being a part of this commemoration today, and we hope you will continue to join us for this memorial for many years to come. Thank you. Oh, uh -huh. 